Mass surveillance has been at the forefront of public awareness since former U.S. intelligence officer Edward Snowden broke cover and exposed the extent of U.S. data gathering. Snowden's revelations opened the door to greater public accountability for secret services, but not much has changed in practical terms, and European intelligence agencies continue to argue for more intrusive powers to gather data and break increasingly complex encryption systems. Brussels has a long history as a spy centre, with 20,000 lobbyists, 1,500 foreign journalists, 2,500 international agencies, and 5,000 accredited diplomats. The emails of European Council President have been hacked, allegedly by the Chinese, though Beijing denied this, and photocopiers are regularly targeted by spies at European institutions, conveniently sending duplicate copies to spies outside. On one occasion, the breach was traced to a telephone number at NATO. Brussels is one of the main cities for spying, so the spying business here is uh, one of the biggest. And um, therefore, everyone should be aware of these somehow, Germany is preparing the way for an integrated European army. If a European Union army is created, then EU INSEN, the EU's intelligence analysis center, will need a massive capabilities upgrade. In 2013, the former commissioner, Vivian Redding, now an MEP, called for the EU to create its own CIA. Redding's idea was shot down, but it's gathering support today. I'm still convinced that we need a kind of a European army. I would say if we are Looking to Russia and uh, Ukraine, um, we are all of a sudden also faced with military intervention. What the European army would obviously need whenever it materializes, and this may be the medium term or the long term future or even further down the road, uh, when it materializes what it certainly needs is primarily military intelligence. Uh, obviously that's best when there is a centralized unit dealing with that. It's not just information sharing that requires a common capability. That's for sure. So as far as military intelligence uh, goes, I believe that's unavoidable. Angela Merkel's CDU policy team has set out a 10-point plan for military cooperation in Europe. The Telegraph reported the strategy is understood to closely reflect Merkel's thinking. It calls for a permanent EU military headquarters, combined weapons procurement and a shared military doctrine. And the Germans say it's urgent. I think the um, a kind of a cooperation center at the first stage probably might be helpful to analyze all different types from all intelligence services from the member states. Therefore, a kind of a step-by-step -step approach in this direction would be um, helpful and probably it's necessary. We have had a lot of uh, combinations together under the NATO umbrella and indeed under the umbrella of the United Nations where a considerable number of European elements from different countries have got together. But as for a European army itself, um, I think that that is going to be a very difficult concept to get across. Do you not accept the premise that if we're going to have an EU army then we need our own military intelligence to manage that army? Well, you know, I think there are several you know, wrongful steps in this. We don't need an EU army. I think it would be a very dangerous development for uh, the European Union to become a militarized European Union. So I think there has to be a very, very strong uh, people's movement to stop the militarization of the EU. Sources I spoke with were clear that if an EU army is on the horizon, then INSEN will need the authority of a treaty declaration to expand its operations. It will certainly need a much bigger budget, and with a bigger budget will come more scrutiny. The need for budget constraints at the moment is pressing the military, including in the UK. Is there not more to be gained from a unified European army and intelligence agency simply on budgetary issues? No, I think there would be so much uh, re-equipping necessary for a start to get everybody working on the same basis. Uh, we already, we still have a situation where in fact uh, ammunition is different in different countries. Um, the, the chain of command is different in different countries. Bringing all that lot together is a massive political challenge and while we're doing that and um, being distracted with that, lots of things are going on in the world that we ought to be tackling. But we need a capability to identify better the smugglers and the traffickers. I was visiting actually two days ago uh, the flagship of the Italian Navy of the Operation Mare Sicuro. And of course they are doing a great job for, for us, for the European Union on that. Uh, that's absolutely essential to be able to combat the smugglers with drones, with other uh, technological means and uh, definitely should be at the service of all the European Union.
In September, the Financial Times reported that Andrew Parker, Director General of British Intelligence Agency MI5, said the nature of Islamic extremism, especially ISIS, is different from previous terrorist threats. Parker argues that mainstream, consumer-driven data encryption is now so complex and widespread that it seriously limits data collection. It's estimated that security agencies now need to be able to hack more than 1 million smartphone apps. Parker believes that modern encryption now benefits terrorists more than the agencies fighting them. Some people will be familiar that when you go to your banking website or even now your common email providers, there'll be a little green lock in the top left-hand corner. This allows you to communicate securely to prevent other actors, including criminals, from being able to intercept those communications. In this instance, the Israeli company offered to provide an SSL man-in-the-middle solution, creating fake certificates that would allow the state to be able to intercept these supposedly secure communications. We don't know whether such a system was eventually sold, but the offering of it and the fact that that system is exploitable is something that we should all bear in mind. The Lisbon Treaty clearly states that national security is the competence of the member states, so INSEN operates within a grey area. INSEN is just about legal. It doesn't have a formal legal basis in the EU treaties. Last year, Liberal MEP Sophie Interveld questioned the premise for its existence. It operates within the Directorate of the European External Action Service, overseen by the current High Representative Federica Mogherini. If this were a James Bond film, she would be M. How would we be sure of someone's loyalty if they were working for the European agency? Well, we totally couldn't. I think we cannot, you know, people would be, have to report back to, you know, and, and they would have double loyalties. And then people, people spy, the different members, they spy apparently on each other. They would continue to do that. And they would then, in addition to that, spy on the European spy agency. Europe is not a nation. Europe is a whole lot of nations. And yes, of course, it's perfectly true that uh, the intelligence agencies do have to owe their loyalty to the state, however it is constituted. But that doesn't stop them from cooperating. Usually this requires decades to build, uh, decades of uh, positive experience about the benefits, mutual benefits of sharing sensitive information. Uh, and that's very difficult just to order from any political center. Uh, it rarely works in, uh, in that way. However, if you start small, if there are particular projects and some of the anti-terrorist uh, in intelligence uh, measures are of that nature that they bear fruit and they do not represent any uh, measurable harm to your own intelligence system, you can build on that. I can think of a relationship, for instance, between the UK agencies and the French. It has been very close for some years and has actually prevented a number of acts of terrorism from taking place. Intelligence failures have led to shocking terrorism in the European Union. Often the information has been available to identify potential attackers but it wasn't shared. We live in a sort of atmosphere where we are feeling safe. The truth of the matter is the only reason that we're feeling safe or the only reason that we are pretty safe is the fact that we have intelligence agencies working hard 24-7. National resources are limited and while national security remains the remit of member states, the effective sharing of information could lead to greater counter-terrorism success. Not only that, Organised crime doesn't respect national borders, so NSEN may have a pivotal role in supporting Europol and Frontex. Intelligence sources told me that NSEN could come to be viewed not as a threat to national intelligence agencies, but as a valued added resource, a real partner in information exchange. We must uh turn our perspective outward again and not just start thinking about the challenges that, that threaten Europe only when they reach our own shores, as we've seen in the case of the refugee crisis, but really determine where we stand uh, in the time and in, in the world that's changing very fast and develop a powerful foreign and security policy based on values very rapidly. The challenge for INSEN will be to work out what its core values will be, protecting and advancing the economic interests of the European Union, supporting key policy initiatives, or ensuring a human rights and civil liberties agenda. Whatever its core values, it cannot please the whole political spectrum. Whatever the future of Europe's military structures, it is clear that European policymakers need better operational and strategic intelligence. A new generation of analysts 
Not spies gunning for queen and country, but spooks coding for peace and prosperity.